Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. The thing about science, as with many other intellectual areas, is that there are a whole bunch of interesting questions out there, and the questions linger on, but the rate at which we make progress on different questions is highly variable. We can have a question sitting around for a very long time and not a lot of progress is made, and then suddenly things change extremely rapidly. So there are fields of science, really tiny or really big subfields, that are undergoing tremendous revolutions even as we speak, and one of these is the study of exoplanets, planets around stars other than our sun. When I was in graduate school, we didn't have any exoplanets. None had actually been discovered. These days, over 5,000 exoplanets have been discovered. So there's a lot to say about this whole science, not just what the exoplanets are, what their characteristics are, but of course, we're going to care about the possibility of life on other planets. But let's not skip right to the weird stuff about life and aliens and things like that. Let's get down and dirty. Let's ask, how do you go about finding exoplanets in the first place? Today's guest, John Asher Johnson, literally wrote the book on this subject. He's the author of How Do You Find an Exoplanet, which is sort of a semi-technical book. If you are happy with a couple of algebraic equations, you'll get a lot out of it. And in the book, he goes over all sorts of different ways, because there's more than one method for finding planets around other stars. You can look at the wobbles of the stars, you can look at transits, little eclipses, you can look at gravitational lensing, and so forth. We now have not just planets that we found with telescopes based here on Earth, but also missions on satellites that are dedicated to finding new planets. And as I'm recording this, we're in the process of ramping up the James Webb Space Telescope, JWST, which will be really, really able to examine exoplanets with much higher precision than we've ever done before. So finding them is one thing, studying them is yet another one. So I talked with John about where we are, how we got there, where we're going to go in the near future in the study of exoplanets. And it really is transformative. It really is both a combination of having better technology to show things that we suspected were true all along, and also, as is very typical in science, being surprised finding out that what we expected was not exactly what is out there. There are a wider variety of planets out there than we initially guessed. I mean, to be fair to us, we only had the solar system as our data point. So there is a menagerie of different kinds of planetary systems, and they're all over the place. We're just beginning. Even though we have 5,000 planets, that's a very, very tiny fraction of all of them. So this is a new kind of science, a new science that we're beginning to learn at in an exciting new way. You can get it on the ground floor by listening to this podcast. Well, I have you here. I will mention that we have recently launched a scholarship program, the Mindscape Big Picture Scholarship. If you want to learn more about it, go to bold.org, B-O-L-D dot org slash scholarships slash Mindscape. And so the idea is we're crowdsourcing funding so you can contribute I've contributed, and what's going to happen is every year, at least this year, hopefully in years to come, we're going to pick one person who wants to have a little bit of help going to college to study the biggest question. So, you know, not applied stuff, not uh, things that are going to be better in the short term for them and their families, although that's very important. The biggest, hardest questions of physics, philosophy, biology, neuroscience, all of these different areas. So if you want to study that, you can apply for the Big Picture Scholarship, and one winner will be chosen every year to get $10,000 to help defer their college tuition costs. Now, I say one winner will be chosen. That's only if we only get that much money by the way of donations. We have made our first goal. We have 10 k so we will be giving out a scholarship this year. But we're continuing to raise money, so maybe we can help more than one person, or maybe we can roll it over to future years. So please, if you have any interest, go to bold.org slash scholarships slash Mindscape and contribute. Uh, I'd like to think that maybe somebody who is going to get this scholarship will be nudged towards asking these big picture questions. Maybe they'll discover a planet. Maybe they'll discover life on other planets. Maybe they'll figure out how life began in the first place. I don't know, but we can at least put our money a little bit in a direction of making that happen. So with that, let's go. (laughs) 
John Johnson. Welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. So I got to say, when I was in grad school, we didn't have any exoplanets. You know, we we knew that there was something we wanted to look for. And in fact, when uh-huh. I was in grad school was exactly when they first started saying, yeah, maybe, maybe there's some evidence out there. But now there's thousands of them. So let's just mm-hmm. put things in context. Uh, give us the very broad overview of how far we've come in the last mumble-de-mumble years since I was in grad yeah. school. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, so I think things have evolved rapidly and often quite wildly by studying exoplanets full of surprises. Um, And so I guess maybe I can put this in the context of like what the paradigm was back then uh, Mm -hmm. when planets were first discovered. And let's think about like how that has shifted. Um, I think back then uh, the idea of how of what uh star sorry what planets around other stars might look like was informed largely by our own solar system mm. and so you know f- hundreds of years of noticing that plant the planets are coplanar and they move in almost perfectly circular orbits made it natural to believe that like okay yeah they all must have formed out of flattened disk dust and gas and that the big planets were further out and the little planets were closer in that also made sense for for that formation scenario and so everybody expected to what when you go not looking for planets if you ever did look for planets you would expect to find things like our solar system right and in 1995 that just turned everything on its head because the first planet that was found was about the same mass as jupiter but it had a three-day orbit (laughs) not not a 12-year orbit but a you know three-day orbit and that was instantaneously you know like who ordered that where did that come from I guess we better go to the drawing board. And I think it's just a, it's a science that grew up surpri- like changing the way that we think about planets and then ultimately our own planet and ourselves. And so where are we now? How many planets have we found roughly? I think we just crossed the 5,000 mark. 5,000 exoplanets. So, and is that yeah. steady progress or are there going to be sort of leaps when we get new technologies or new satellites or whatever? There, historically, there have been leaps when new technology and, um, I think it's really interesting with the the field of exoplanets in particular is that it, you know, when you think of astronomy, you think about like getting to bigger and bigger and bigger telescopes. You know, you're looking at things that are harder and harder and harder to see and study. Um, And, and so like cutting edge of astrophysics has always been like, Oh, what's the next big telescope? Oh, 30 meters. Oh my God. You know, but (laughs) a lot of what's done with exoplanets is that as the field has matured and grown better at, you know, as astronomers have grown better at what what they do, they're finding that we actually need uh, smaller telescopes. Let's get like, let's get 10, 10 centimeters. That's okay. That's, that sounds about right. And it's, uh, uh, but really the technological advance was not necessarily the diameter of the telescope. It was the just the focus and the dedication of that telescope's mission, huh. and so I think what we're finding that's the way exoplanets is, has evolved is that you know, we're we're in this era of dedicated NASA missions that do nothing else but this one way of looking at, planets. and that's what's led to these big discontinuity number of planets here. Does, does that imply that we kind of could have done it earlier if we had just put our minds to it? Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, possibly. I think, I guess the caveat there is that there was uh, there was a certain threshold that needed to be crossed in detector technology. Oh, uh, okay. Once, that makes once sense. Once that happened around 2000-ish, then it was, yeah, it was pretty easy to... And you mentioned that the, that, the, that, the, that, the, that first planet, the Jupiter, that was has such a short orbital period was a little bit of a surprise. So now 5,000 mm-hmm. planets in, are we still surprised? Is the solar system kind of an outlier or do we just, was that just sort of a selection effect? It was easier to find a big close planet. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it is absolutely easier in a three day orbit than in a 12 year orbit. You, you don't have to wait 12 years there to you see go. the orbit go by, <laughs> right? So uh, that if nothing else, but there's other reasons as well. Like the signal is just larger. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, it's definitely true that they that they were easier to detect, but they also had to be there. And the fact that they were their their occurrence rate was not zero, yeah. was instantly like you know as a surprise. But yeah, that, as the years went on, I think for the first five years, hot Jupiters were the kind of planet that were discovered, and there was a large collection of them. And but then as the surveys ran for longer, they were able to see longer orbits go by, and there are examples of gas giant planet, multi-year orbits. Mm. 
So hot uh, Jupiters was the thing because hot because just because they're close to the star, not in any intrinsic yeah. about Jupiter itself. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's our very clever naming scheme for this class of planet. <laughs> is is that oh, it's right next to its star. It's hot, and it's the size of Jupiter. Hot there Jupiter. you go. <laughs> and so, what do we know now about that distribution? Is the solar system kind of typical? <sighs> well, it, I think the answer to that is like a lot of answered a lot of scientific questions. Is it depends. Um, if you're thinking about uh, coplanarity, uh, we're seeing that there's a, a decent size sample, of, but we've also seen systems that have their planets wildly out of orbit. Um, so Wait, in sorry, some ways, sorry, you the mean... solar system fits, but there's a whole class of planets that did So you mean we, we found, so there are systems where all of the orbits of very, of mo the multiple planets are in the same plane, mm -hmm. but there's also <laughs> systems where the, they're not in the same plane. That's right. Yeah. So like you can think of it as like uh, the, the grooves on a, a on a record um and so that's what i mean by coplanar yeah but imagine if you like cut out the center portion of that record and then tilted it with respect to the rest of the record and those are two different orbits with the there's examples of oh, okay uh and sometimes and there's also examples of misalignment with the, the spin of the central star and in the solar system the sun spins in the same direction that the earth right. orbits and all the other planets um, but we found examples of planets that go backwards with respect to the sun. So we have these retrograde, planets. not the apparent retrograde that we see like sure. Venus and, and Mercury, but actual retrograde that they're orbiting in the quote wrong way. And so you can find examples of planetary systems that share characteristics with our solar system. So our solar system is not a complete outlier, but there's entire populations of planets out there that look absolutely nothing like this. And so if you ask like, how does it fit in in the whole ensemble? It starts to look a little rare. Okay, a little bit rare. I mean that's yeah. that's fascinating because the solar system, of course, is the data point we have the most familiarity with. So there's some bias yep. there, yep. but it also seems kind of natural if we think about how planets are supposed to be formed that they would be yeah. in the plane and moving the same way as the star. So is this radically right. revising our theories of how planetary systems get formed? It's, yeah, I mean, it 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 indicates that the revision needs to happen. Okay, it's that is actually we still don't really have any good explanation, like any solid, experimentally tested uh, theory for how you get a retrograde planet. Okay, uh, I can wave my hands with the best of them and describe some <laughs> scenarios, but we don't know that. Like that, that's not understood. It's guessed, and it's done after the fact. You know, we yeah. saw the result of the experiment. We're like, hey, I, I have a great question for it. it it's it's a little bit backwards. Um, so, <laughs> but we tell good stories about how those things. Well, I, and and those and those stories are very different than the way that things happen on Earth. We are not averse to the occasional waving of hands here on the Mindscape podcast. So, I presume that. Uh some crazy gravitational interaction or something like that, or you capture yeah. by a flyby. I don't know what would be the, your favorite hand wavy scenario. Um, my, my favorite scenario and the one that I've done like the most to test, I suppose would be, um, there's a, there's a gravitational, well, let's just put it this way. First of all, that, uh, the earth going around the sun, it does so because the sun is, is tugging on it. It feels the sun's gravity. But as the Earth goes around the sun, it also feels really tiny nudges from the gravitational pulls of all the other planets. Mm -hmm. And the way that works out for the Earth is that it's negligible compared to the, sun, the pull of the sun, and it doesn't really affect the long-term evolution, of, depending on what you mean, like long-term. Right. <laughs> um, so it, it, it's, it's stable. It's fine. Uh, and, and, it, and the interactions are not significant. But you can construct an orbital system that has a planet uh, orbiting maybe, let's say, at the Earth's sun. Mm -hmm. And then you have a, a, a companion star, because maybe the sun of that solar system is in a binary. And that companion star sits out beyond. Okay. It's, it's out there, right? And what that does, it can actually set up this set of gravitational interactions where the orbit of the planet in response to the gravitational tug of that outer companion, that other star, it starts getting longer and more eccentric so that it becomes less circular. It's mm -hmm. more of an oval shape. And then it can oscillate between that and then a misaligned state where it goes up over the poles of its star hmm. and it stays perfectly circular. And so it can exchange inclination and eccentricity and the sort of like harmonic oscillators 
Okay, so that's the first act of the story. It's a pretty good one. Okay, good. Okay. And then the next act of the story, the planet um, starts feeling tidal force. The central star, when it goes in on this highly eccentric orbit, it is like buzzes the star's atmosphere and gets in real close. And then the star is stretching it. And that drains energy from the whole system. And the consequence of that for an orbital system is that it takes that long, wide orbit and becomes more circular. Okay. And then you end up with a hot Jupiter that's going up over the poles of its star in the other direction because of these gravitational interactions. So I guess the... Actually, before I say that, let me remind myself, is it correct that the solar system itself is thought to be unstable? If we waited billions of years, uh, various planets would get kicked out? Yeah, I, I think that's still believed um, that like, the, the fact that we even settled into the specific stable configuration is somewhat was somewhat of a lucky draw. But yeah, and it's all like, you know, chaos theory type stuff where right. we're talking about. <laughs> so it, these are simulated a different initial conditions that have led to unstable endpoints where we are now. And I guess uh, I'm just uh, like you cooking this up after the fact, but the fact that there is a bias when we look for exoplanets for planets that are heavy because they have a big effect and close to the star because they're short periods, maybe those are the ones where it's more likely that some crazy orbital dynamics um, has going on. I think that's true, but the I think that's countered by the fact that the sensitivity of the search methods is such that we're complete to Jupiter's at being Jupiter. You know, so it's not that oh, okay. we are more sensitive to those oddball planets quite often, but that's not to the detriment of like missing uh, the uh, of the rest of the population. So we get a pretty holistic view. So when you talk about completeness, you mean that. For the stars we've looked at, if there was a yeah. Jupiter out to a certain distance, we would definitely right. find it. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. good to know. And uh, the other obvious question is, roughly speaking, what fraction of stars or what fraction of stars like the sun have planets? It's a big fraction. Yeah, so I if I were to say like um, there was uh, one planet for every two stars, I, I, I could express that as like um, the, the planet occurrence 0.5. It's half, right? Um, right? So if it's one out of three, I call it one third. And if every single, if every single star had a planet, then it would be one. <laughs> okay. So mm -hmm. the uh, a study that I I did with a collaborator a few years ago, we found that that number is five. You know, there's there's five planets mm. per star, which means that there's more planets right. in the Milky Way than there are stars in the Milky Way. Um, yeah. And pretty much, you know, every single planet, every single star that you look at, if you were to look at it in every possible way, you'd likely come up with not only one planet, but multiple planets. Because you could get uh, a five to one ratio if some stars had a hundred ah, planets yeah, that's true. and yep. most of them didn't. But but you're saying it's not like that. It's more like most stars have a planet. That's, a, that's or a actually a, an excellent observation. And you know we, we were able to, to look at the populations in other ways that show that it's not, it's not that skewed. Um, but it does have okay. interesting ways of, of preferring certain outcomes, but yeah. And I remember that in some circles that fact that so many stars had planets was considered a bit surprising. Like, look at all those planets. But I was never surprised. Yeah. That, you know, on the basis of the one data point we have in the solar system, it makes perfect sense to me there should be planets. Was, was I too sanguine or were no, other I'm people with you on that. too conservative? I, I, I'm with you. I'm also a human and you're also a human. And so it's like possible for us to hold, you know, like, oh, yeah, of course, on the one <laughs> hand. And on the other <laughs> hand, it's like, that's never been done. And it just got done. Wow. Right. So those two can like kind of act in intention. Um, and I think that that's happened for the community. And it's that whole, that there's also a part of the, like, there's the paradigm uh, before the first plants were found about like what, what solar systems should look like. Um, but there's also just like the way of placing value on certain aspects of astronomy and what should be done to, in order to do good astronomy. Yeah. And in the 1980s, it was not, it was not, cons it was, it wasn't really considered possible to be a good astronomer and do something like looking for planets. Are you kidding? <laughs> like, so and that's something I think that scientists forget is that like we do hard selection process on like what is valued. Yeah. And that comes about through a whole set of things, but just, it's important to know back in the eighties, like it just was not, it just didn't get funded. You couldn't get telescope time to do something like that. That's just, what's the value? 
that is a great point, I think, because it happens with many things, with supernova surveys, uh, with gravitational waves, with various things mm -hmm. where once mm -hmm. you find them, it's obvious that you should be putting a huge amount of effort into doing this. But yep. before the first example happens, there's a there really is a lot of inertia and conservatism in the community. Yep. And you know, all the stuff is yep. expensive, so you can understand why, but it makes you wonder what other things were missing. Yeah, I mean, I think astronomers are like all academics and most academics like self-liberal, but in their actual, like in their actions, they're quite conservative in the sense that like there's a, an agreed upon, not an, only an agreed upon like answer to some set of questions, but there's an agreed upon set of questions that, that one is allowed to ask. Right. And asking how, how, what fraction of those stars out there have planets around them was not really seen as a valid question. Um even if you could like go back in time and use the exact same appeals that we use based on like now the justification that we have now, it might not even go over so well. <laughs> so in that sense, it was surprising that there was a planet there. It was surprising that that right. planet was so interesting. And oh my God, and all of a sudden you start seeing the shift in the way that people think, like not only what questions they're asking, but like that that question is now allowable, that it's, that question's okay. Yeah, I mean, I can absolutely uh, verify your judgment that in the 80s, this was not considered respectable. And I do think that uh, I would have voted that almost all stars have planets, but I'm not going to, I don't want to give anyone the impression that I was out there saying we should go look for them. Oh, you, you were <laughs> that, publishing on this? I was not when I was an undergraduate. Uh, again, I should have. Yeah, this is a, it's a thought out there for current undergrads. Like, what are the yeah. old folks missing? That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What are we missing now? And the other thing I want to get up on the table in terms of the population of exoplanets is that there are apparently planets that don't have any stars that are just in between the stars mm. floating around. Yeah. Uh, oh, man. I don't remember this firmly enough to know that I have it exactly right. But I think the name that was given to this class of planet called Solivigant, okay. <laughs> uh, which means a, a lone wanderer. Um, I think one of is one of the scientists. Oh God, now I can't even remember which scientist it was, so I can give them proper credit. But they, maybe they won't want the credit if I got the word wrong. But anyway, yeah, there these lone wanderers are out there in the Milky Way, and um, it's there are theories for what they're doing <laughs> there are up theories. there. <laughs> but like you know, it, it, how did this thing get orphaned from its star, right. or 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 do we not understand star formation well enough? to understand that this might be like one of the possible outcomes of making stars. Well, I think it's because a lot of people don't uh, have the background knowledge about star formation, et cetera. I mean, I would personally put a large credence that these planets used to be associated with stars at the moment of their formation mm -hmm. and somehow got kicked out. But is it sure, possible yeah. that they just, f a planet formed in between the stars? Well, there was, a, there was an undergraduate here um, who looked at the possibility along with their advisor james guijan at ingerma um they were looking at the question of whether you could at the center of the milky way this giant supermassive black hole and i promise yeah. this connects to plants it sounds okay. wild for, <laughs> as a start but okay there's this supermassive black hole that's a million times the mass and around that black hole is a population of stars that are hanging out down there or formed mm -hmm. there or I, we don't exactly know but they're there and um and every once in a while, one of these stars will get too close to the black hole and it'll get sort of spaghettified, stretched out into a long stream of hydrogen and star guts. And the question that Eden studied was, uh, could any of the stretched out spaghetti fied star turn into little populations of Jupiters? Okay. And if so, if that was something that actually happened, then like what would be the occurrence of these? And um, it has a really fun question project that's yeah. a really out there project it doesn't fit neatly under the like what's accepted to study or what questions interesting to ask but she showed it was at least plausible cool you know, that, so that that question exists out there for any aspiring young astronomers who might get to graduate school and an advisor who really run loose or, or if not they can do it surreptitiously while their advisor is not looking that's always that's always possible yep. okay good. or the paradigm might, might shift by then. the par right it could be the common thing it could be the hot topic you never know <laughs> um i mean my own experience was i was the world's expert at the cosmological constant and dark energy mm. before mm -hmm. they found it so that it was not very exciting before they found it but suddenly it yeah. was exciting through no fault of my own <laughs> yeah, that's right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just had to find the right question to ask. I, I it's not going to be encouraged, but you actually can ask it, right? 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Anyway, okay, so let's think about how we detect them. I mean, that's really why we're here. You've written a book called yeah. How Do You Find an Exoplanet? Uh, mm -hmm. I encourage anyone who is interested in checking it out, although it does have equations in it. We're not afraid of equations here on the Mindscape podcast, oh, cool. so that's okay. okay. Um, yeah. But so how do you find them? I mean, presumably the big obstacle is that stars are bright and planets are dim. Is that an oversimplification? Yeah, I think that is a excellent way of putting it. And that uh, difference in, in brightness also mirrored in the, the mass ratios. Like Jupiter is huge by planet standards, but it's only one thousandth of the sun. Yeah. And so um, the we're talking about very small signal in the presence of very high contrast. And so um, like, let's take it for example, like if you want to do direct imaging of a planet. Yeah, perfect. The the analogy that I once worked out, and I, and I think it's the one I use in my book, is to if you're trying to find a, the glow of a Jupiter-sized planet sitting next to its star from the Earth, and let's put that star at like Proxima, so it's as close mm -hmm. as stars get. Um, the analogy is uh, that I'm on a lighthouse with a cigarette lighter that I turn on, and your job is to see the light from the lighter against the glare of the lighthouse, right. but Let's put you, the observer, in California. Let's put the lighthouse <laughs> in Hawaii. And now we got the scale right. <laughs> okay. All right. So, <laughs> so it's a challenge. It, it's, it's the contrast is one aspect of it. You nailed that. And the other is just the signals are so small. Like right. Like the, the actual signal that you're looking for. Well, so you mentioned direct imaging. I mean, we don't need to go in order of, of plausibility. So let's just ask the dumb question first. Like, can't mm -hmm. you just take a really big telescope, use the best detectors we have, point it at a star, and take pictures of any planets that might be around it? Yeah, in principle, yes, you can. Do, uh, but your obstacles that you have to overcome pull that off. And the biggest obstacle is this big, annoying thing called the Earth's atmosphere. Hmm. Sorry, it perspectives everything, but like you know, for an astronomer, <laughs> the the atmosphere in the way causes a lot of heartache and, and headaches. Um, and so, even with like a really great optical design and a huge telescope after and a really wonderful detector, you still have to stare. Like basically, it's like trying to to see a, um, a freckle on your friend's face, and you're at the bottom of a pool. And you're looking up at the rippling through the rippling surface, and you're trying to discern mm. whether there's that little speck on their cheek or something. Um, so you have to overcome this the motion of the atmosphere, or the, the the obscuring effects of the of the atmosphere. And there are technologies that are allowing us to do that. And as technology advances, this actually involves changing the shape of the mirror of the telescope in exact same way that the the atmosphere being deformed above the telescope which is a really cool engineering feat. <laughs> and so that, that's changing on microsecond levels. You have to change the mirror shape, the, the, the actual, you know, are you, are you literally the, putting some servo motors under the mirror to work? Yeah, it? there's little tiny servos sitting underneath uh, what's actually a very small scaled down version of the main mirror. But nonetheless, you're moving a mirror around fast enough to cope with the atmosphere. And uh, <laughs> so that's just like a huge engineering problem that yeah. you have to overcome first and that you have to rely on that well and you have to understand the system very well so that you can still barely pick out the spec there so is that a, a a future prospect kind of thing that will be a big deal or is it just we can do it in principle but it's never going to be the leading procedure uh it's it's that latter one uh because um right now detection sensitivity well and let's say like when imaging first started detecting planets all they were seeing were baby planets that had just formed, and on the on, because they had just formed, they were still gravitationally contracting and glowing on their own, like little miniature stars. Mm -hmm. So there, the contrast is is evened out a lot because the planet's shining bright. But the issue with that is there's only so many places that we can see young stars, and those places are not nearby. So okay, it, so that, but we're still nonetheless we're able to find planets that way. Um, more recent advances since those early detections have brought us to the extremely massive planet, very widely separate from their star. But mm -hmm. again, you're just in both of these techniques, you're limited by the number of targets you have. Uh, okay. you, you get down to a certain sensitivity and you're really excited that in principle you can find, but now you're just kind of limited by the number of stars that are close enough for that technology to really work for you. Is there some high tech version of putting my thumb up to block out the bright thing so I can see the dark thing? <laughs> yep, that's a, that that technique right there is called coronography. 
Okay. Uh, it was brought over from the people who study the sun using basically a little spot that blocks out the, the light from the sun so you can see the, the corona and the flares and things like that that's often behind a corona. And we can use a, a, a similar type of thing, uh, blurring out the light or blocking out the light. Um, it's much, it turns out like the technical details of what goes on with how that works, it's way different than the way your thumb kind of blocks it out. But the end effect is the same. We're trying to just push the light from the star down so that we can see what's around it. Right. Okay, so if that is you know, an obvious thing to try, but is not the most effective, what what in your mind is the most effective way to find these exoplanets? Because you found some. How many planets have you found? Do you have a like? Is there a number on your CV? How many planets you found? <laughs> I once did it. I once counted it. I, it was it was close to a hundred. Hundred uh, planets. Like, but it depends good. on how you like assign credit, and sure. you know, like if we only yeah. So. These are teamwork um, kind of things, right? Yeah, these are teamwork things. I've been on teams that have found well over well over a hundred. Um, yeah. So the, the method, like, most effective would kind of implies that, like, we, we have all of the money in the world that we can pour into every different technique, and then we can, like, sum up, like, which one found more planets. Yeah. But, like, you know, where where resources have been invested and where it's been most effective uh, in terms of, like, the outcomes is, is transits. By, because, uh, and that's the method where you're looking for the planet to eclipse the light of, the, of its central star. So that it has its orbit aligned in space just right, so it passes in front of its star and eclipses it. And um, they're called transits if it's a planet. It's an eclipse if it's a star. Um, but the technique is the transit technique. And that's found the vast majority of, of, of known planets. And in part because that's what's used by the Kepler satellite, right, which is in a lot of this yeah. heavy lifting. Yeah. It's, the, it's also the detection method that can make do with the smallest telescope which makes it well suited for putting it on a satellite, getting up above the Earth's atmosphere and, and, and being able to see things really clearly. Maybe tell us a little bit about Kepler because it's no longer working, right? These things are yeah. a lifetime. Yeah, so the Kepler mission um, was, a, um, was a space telescope that went up in 2009 and was launched into what's called an Earth trailing orbit. So it orbited the sun but its orbital separation was just a little bit longer than the Earth's. And so it just sat out there <laughs> in cold space as the Earth drifted away. And um, and what was great about Kepler yeah. is that it was single-minded in its in, in its science goals. It, it just, there were basically like no movable or interchangeable parts on that thing. It was like, you it, it popped off the dust cover from the front mirror, from the mirror, and it was just that, it just stared at space. <laughs> so there was the Kepler field that the telescope looked at and it stared at it for, um, well, the original mission was three years, but it went years past past its original mission. So it didn't scan the sky. It, was it didn't just scan. Really it focusing just stared on... at one, like, yep. one sector of the, of the night sky. And there were millions of stars in that patch of sky that Kepler could see. And... Uh, that gave it uh, lots and lots of opportunities to see transits. And uh, it turned out transits by the thousands by the time it was done. So I, I'm betting that there are people asking, well, why didn't it scan? There are even more stars elsewhere. But I, I, I'm betting also that the point is it's waiting for rare events. So it makes just as much sense to just stay on one star as to keep That's right. collecting new stars. Yeah, yeah. If you take a, a whole box of hot Jupiters and you dump them out into the Milky Way mm -hmm. and they all tumble out of the box, then only um, one tenth of all of those hot Jupiter systems would have the alignment necessary for a transit. Okay. So the random orientation of all these stars and planetary systems in space is similar to like dumping them out of the box. They're just randomized all over the place. And they so it's only 10%. Um, and that decreases really rapidly as you move away from the central right. star. It goes over, it decreases. It's one over the distance away from the central star. And so by the time you get out to the Earth's orbit, it's only like 1%. And it just keeps decreasing as you go further away. So you need to look at lots and lots of stars to get this chance alignment to work out for you. Right. So the chance alignment reflects the fact that you need uh, us the planet and the star to be on a line with each other. That's right. if, if the star orbits perpendicular to our line of sight, it's invisible as far as this technique is concerned. That's right. Yeah. So the, the larger the sample that you're looking at, the, the greater, you know, you'll just find more, more, more planets, right. but you have to get above a certain threshold. And could you see something as tiny as the earth against something as big as the sun uh, with this kind of technique? And 
principle um kepler i mean kepler was designed to be able to detect the earth around the sun as okay. viewed from far away okay so um, we could do it that I, <clears throat> there are a number of systems that like bore a lot of resemblance to the mm. to the earth sun system in different ways some were orbited closer in sometimes the planet was a little bit larger but you know basically those types of systems are confirmed to exist but the majority of the planets that were found were closer to the star where they were more likely to pass in front of it. Sure. And also, how long did Kepler look? You said about a decade? I can't remember the exact duration of K2, um, which was the mission that came after the original Kepler. So it went for three okay. years, and then it got renewed for three years, and then it got renewed for three years. And it just was, it just kept on chugging. Um, it wasn't supposed to have enough fuel. It, it broke down. It just actually broke down because <laughs> um, it has these three little reaction wheels that keep it pointed at that same place. These little gyroscopes uh -huh. that keep it stable and its angular momentum. And one of them, it actually had four when it launched. The first one failed right away. The next one failed after uh -huh. about a, a year after the extended mission. And Kepler was just like starting to wobble. Wobble. And it wasn't. <laughs> So what they figured out that the NASA engineers figured out is that they could <laughs> the solar panels on the back of it are are like a, the roof on a house. They come up to a point. And so what they did is they oriented Kepler, the telescope, into the stream of photons coming from the sun. And the exchange of momentum from all those photons breaking over the solar panels, like it was the bow of a boat, stabilized it wow. in that third dimension. Wow. And then that was the K2 mission. And that just went on. Yeah, so I think it all told it must be about a decade. They are clever, those NASA engineers, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'm glad you brought that up because it, it's a reminder, again, people who don't do this for a living, the precarity of being a scientist working on one of these missions. You can't you can't go up yeah. and fix it. This is not in Earth orbit, right? One, yeah. Like yeah. you said, one wheel broke instantly, and if two had broke instantly, we'd have been in trouble. That's right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um that's why space missions are, are so expensive and in, in, in part is just because of the precision that had to be, they, there's just no room for error. Not to mention that you have to put it on this gigantic exploding tower and send right. it up into Earth's orbit. But, <laughs> um, and there was a, there was a, the test mission. Is that a, a follow-up? Yeah. So the test mission was the follow-up and you asked, why, why don't you scan? And mm. test answered that question and said, yeah, why not? And let's, so let's scan. And so what test does is it trades off the duration of the survey so kepler went for you know years and years tests all it what it does is it scans a big stripe of the sky 30 days at a time okay. and then it moves over to the next stripe until it kind of does it paints out the globe around you know the, the night sky around the earth the detectors what's really nice about that though is that the detectors overlap near the pole of, as it's pure reading the mm -hmm. the parts that look up close to the the center of its motion um, overlap from sector to sector. And so you get up to, I think, a year uh, near the poles. But almost uh, for the rest of the sky, you get 30 days. And so what you do is you get to see lots more stars, but you see them for a shorter duration. Yeah. So it's a shallower, broader survey than Kepler was really narrow and deep. And did it, but it found a bunch of planets? Yeah, that's one that, you know, took it from the, you know, a couple thousand uh, that came out of out of Kepler into the five thousand today. Okay. It was just you know mostly. And that just was tests. also the transit method. Mm -hmm. They were looking for the transit method. They were looking for a little decrease in the brightness of the star. Yes, yes, they're using the transit method. And are, is this teamwork? Once you find the planet candidate with one of these satellites, do you follow up with telescopes here on Earth? Yeah, it, it is absolutely a, a team effort. Um, you know, NASA designs, flies, and maintains the mission. And they also um, do a lot of, you know, they're the ones that take the the signals that are being sent from the satellite or the, the space telescope, and they translate that into actual usable data that we as astronomers can use. And so then they okay. pass that on to us. Um, and then <clears throat> that is just, um, that's just data, right? So like you can collect a lot of data and you can get almost no information from it if you don't look at it well enough, right? Or if you don't use the right way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. And so then usually where an astronomy graduate student steps in is figuring out how do I take the data that's handed in these files from NASA and how do I turn that into usable information? Now, 
for Kepler in particular, the, the engineers were very involved, even at that level. They were really helpful in helping us just really get a solid understanding of like, okay, when this thing is lighting up in this way, and you're getting this much, many counts in this little sector, you can trust that this means this and that. And, you know, they understood the instrument and they, so they allowed us to make um, reliable transitions from just raw data into usable information. Um, but then there was a whole extra step where <clears throat> you want to make sure that the thing that looks an awful lot like a, the signal caused by a planet, like that little dip in light for a transit, that can look like a planet, but actually be a different astrophysical phenomenon. <laughs> so, for example, you could have a star that's passing in front of its star, but only their tips graze, and so it's only a small fraction of the light that goes down. Um, and this was a big concern going into the Kepler mission. Um, and when I was at Caltech, I had a graduate student working with me uh, named Tim Morton. Hmm. And he and I uh, figured out that, like, at the precision that Kepler was getting, that the rate of those false positives would be, would be hardly, it would be like a tenth of what was feared. And so, but that nonetheless, you have to go through that process of saying, mm. are we fooling ourselves or how can we feel very confident that we're looking right. at actual planets? <laughs> and Kepler's precision, his photometric precision, just traced out that shape with such clarity that like, it was almost like each Kepler light curve was a textbook version of what a transit should look like. And so, you know, it turned out that the fears came from an earlier era where that signal was very jagged and noisy and you could hide a lot of stuff mm -hmm. in noise. And so we had so little, such little noise with Kepler, but nonetheless, it was, it was kind of accepted protocol that you have to make sure that you take a different telescope, maybe on the ground, maybe one of those systems that corrects for the Earth's atmosphere, and then just takes a quick peek, take a little snapshot and see if you can see another object nearby that could be the, the culprit that's causing a planet light signal. And so that follow-up, that's called ground-based follow-up. Um, so you have the space-based mission that's producing signals in science, but the science, in order to mature fully, needs these ground-based assets. And so that's like where I really positioned myself with the Kepler mission and, and the, you know, the early Kepler mission was doing a lot of the ground-based follow-up. Do I gather from this that we've become more confident in what uh, Kepler itself isn't online anymore, but these days are we less devoted to the idea of the need for a ground-based follow-up if the data are really good? Yeah, I mean, I think it, yeah, the, the, the lesson of like higher precision and dedicated experiment giving you that higher precision means that you have more confidence has really started settling in. But I think okay. that the procedures that people go through to actually publish a, a planet as a new planet still include that legacy of like doing all your due diligence <laughs> to check all around it. Well, I, I like it. I, I think that deal. it's good to be careful with your science, even when, when you have a lot of confidence. That's perfectly fair. And uh, even though Kepler and Tess have done amazing things, we have also found a bunch of planets just here on the ground and not all from transits, right? There's other, there's mm -hmm. a Doppler uh, mechanism, which is an entirely different one. Yeah. So there's the, the, the method of looking for the movements of the star in response to its planet. And so, you know, when we think about uh, planetary systems, we often think about like a, a star orbiting its planet and to a close approximation, that's exactly what's happening is that, the star is stationary and the planet is moving around it. But um, we know that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So the same force that the star is exerting on the planet, the planet is exerting that force back on the star. And that sounds really impressive until you consider that the star is yeah. so much more massive. So it doesn't move much in response to that force, but it does move. And it moves enough that for part of the planet's orbit, it can look like the star is moving towards us. And then as the planet moves around in its orbit, it tugs the star, the star responds, and now it starts moving away from us in its orbit. And that back and forth motion is the signal that we look for using the radial velocity technique. So it is the Doppler shift of the light mm -hmm. from the star that we're looking at, even though we're detecting the yeah. planet, we're actually detecting motion of the star, just to check. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, every, every technique is dependent on a lot of fundamental understanding of the stars mm. in order to understand your planets. Every technique requires that. And almost all techniques require measuring what the star is doing in response to the planet. 
that we see the planet. And how good are we at measuring? I mean, let's let's be very fair to some of the listeners who might not be astrophysically inclined at all. What is this Doppler effect of which you speak, and how do you measure it for a star? <laughs> yeah. So the the Doppler effect is that feature of like if there's an ambulance coming towards you uh, as you're walking on the sidewalk, it it sounds high pitched, and as it moves away from you, it goes lower pitch. So it's like wee 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 woo woo yeah. woo as it moves away. And so that change of tone is is the stretching of the sound waves uh, or the compression of the, of the sound waves as it comes towards you. And the same thing happens with light because light is a particle and it's also a wave. And so the wave-like behavior of light is that when the star is moving towards us, the light emitted from the star gets shifted to the blue. The you know There's a contraction. And as it moves away, there's a stretching. And so there's, it becomes a, 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 red, a reddening of the light. And so what we do is we look for these minute shifts in the, uh, the features of the star as we observe them through uh, a spectrograph, which is like a giant prism. So we spread out all the light. When you look at the sun uh, through one of these prisms, uh, through these spectrographs, you see dark patterns of dark lines. And those sort of form the DNA signal or the fingerprint of the star. And those positions of those dark lines are known to very high precision. And the Doppler effect causes them to all shift together. And so what we can do is we can watch those absorption lines, those dark lines move back and forth. Um, the downside is that they don't shift much at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> it sounds very tiny. Yeah, it's absolutely tiny. So, you know, we're looking at one of those lines move by maybe a one ten thousandth to one one thousandth okay. of its width. So uh, it, and what it translates into is like on our physical detector, um, we're, we're watching this observe, like this picture of the star spectrum shift on the detector by an amount that is equal to about a hundred silicon atoms lined up next to each other. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, the good thing is that uh, the, the trick that we use is that every one of those thousands of absorption lines that we see in the spectrum of, the sun, of a star like the sun, um, all of them shift by the exact same amount. So even though they're all shifting by a tiny amount, all together, they can give us a signal large enough for us to measure. Um, and that's where like a lot of like, if you want the like inside review of what astronomy is about, it's not so much the looking up at the night sky really at all. And it's a lot of asking like, oh my God, how do I do that in software? <laughs> software and <laughs> hardware, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah. And so um, like you asked about it being a team effort is that like that that's where a lot of, a lot of work behind the scenes goes in is like, okay, like in principle that can be done. And I can understand what you just described as being mm -hmm. possible. But then when you sit down and you stare at the data product that, you know, a telescope operator hands you, you're like, oh, okay, like, this, is, <laughs> this, is, this is the nitty gritty. This is going to consume most of my life right here. And I'm, I'm going to guess that this Doppler technique is also, like the transit technique, most sensitive to planets that are in the plane of where we're looking, but maybe not quite as sensitive. I mean, if they were mm -hmm. a little bit out, perfect alignment, you could still maybe get a Doppler shift. That's right. Yeah. The the downside of like, okay, with the transiting planetary system, you know that inclination because there's only a certain tiny range of inclinations that would give you that signal that you're seeing, right? Because it has to right. eclipse. So with the transit method, you you get that inclination built in, even though you miss like a huge fraction of the actual planets. The Doppler technique is sensitive to almost all of those planets that are there. Um, but what you don't get is a measure of that inclination. So the first consequence of this is that if you're, if the mm -hmm. orbital plane, if you're like looking down on the orbital plane, right. um, then you're not going to get much of a signal because the star is moving perpendicular to your line of sight. But the moment you start tilting it away from that, you start seeing a signal. The trick is that you can also change that signal by changing the mass of the planet. So if I make the planet more massive, then I move, make the star move more. Mm -hmm. And moving more looks a lot like being edge on, right? And if I start tilting it, then I start decreasing the signal, which is also analogous to shrinking the mass of the planet in the aligned 
arrangement. And so those two, the mass of the planet and the inclination of the orbit are um, not de determinable on their own. You get a right, mixture okay. of those two things. So you're open to potentially discovering a wider variety of planets, but there's a piece of information about them that you don't have. Yeah, yeah. And it's a, it's a piece of information that, you know, given that it's missing, is it, it complicates things in ways that um, most astronomers missed for a long period of the planet detection era. And okay. it's just the way that the way that Bayesian probabilities work with, you know, inclinations of orbits and um but yeah so but in the early days of finding planets and actually the first planet around a sun-like star that was detected were done with this doppler technique and and a part of the reason that it was successful is that it was so sensitive to a wide range of those inclinations whereas right. transit surveys weren't getting to the point where they can look at enough stars until later in the mm -hmm. game well, once they started showing success and they were doing so with small telescopes, then that became the impetus to put them up into space. And in principle, uh, if a star had multiple planets around it, you could map out the intricate back and forth dance that the star was doing because of all these planets. Yeah. Perturbing. Yeah. Yeah. The way that I, I help my students understand, like, you know, they, they often students are like, how would you ever do that if you had two or three or four or five of these back and forth signals all happening at different periods and at different phases. It just seems like it would be a mess. And, you know, the, the trick is I ask, you know, my more musically talented students, one of them maybe like hum an A and hold that. And then I have another one do a B and then another a C. And I just have everybody just pay attention. That's super complicated what's happening in the air, those back right. and forth motions in the air, but your ear can pick them out just fine. And it becomes this nice segue into understanding like signal processing, but you know, <laughs> the, you can actually separate out those different periods very cleanly and very clearly from one another. And um, it's all using technology that's similar to what's uh, what our ears have evolved. Right. It's interesting to me that the Doppler technique and the transit technique, and even to a lesser extent, the direct imaging technique, they're all able to find planets without like, many orders of magnitude difference between how many we find. It almost seems like a fine tuning problem that these very different methods are giving us ballpark similar kind of uh, results. Yeah, I mean, it's really encouraging. Like, yeah, each each detection technique, like one of the techniques we didn't even talk about was this uh, gravitational lensing technique. Oh, right. Yeah, I did want to talk about that. So I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah. And it takes advantage of the fact that massive body. Einstein gave us a different view of gravity than Newton. Einstein gave us the view that massive objects can, can uh, toward or bend space and time. And a consequence of a massive body bending space and time is that if you had light traveling towards that object, that maybe would have gone by it and then, you know, uh, wouldn't, we wouldn't have, sorry. <laughs> Imagine a background star that you're looking at. Some of its light goes off into directions that you can't see. But if space is warped around a massive object between us and that star, then that can bend the light back into our line of sight in the same way that a lens, a curved piece of glass, bends light rays and, and brings them into focus into our eye. And so um, this microlensing technique uh, takes the situation, this highly improbable seeming event where you have some background star sitting in the Milky Way on the other side of the, or like towards the center of the Milky Way. All right, and you're just observing it in a million or millions of other stars. But it just so happens that between you and that background star, maybe halfway across the galaxy, there's a star moving with respect to you and the background star that has a planet around it. And so the first thing that happens is that star's gravity warps the background light from that background star and you're suddenly seeing more light than you wouldn't than you would have seen otherwise mm. and so the star becomes brighter the background then star becomes as brighter. it the background star appears to get brighter because the foreground star whose light you don't even see but its gravity is <laughs> right. is making it brighter and then it passes through and then it, the, that background star gets dimmer again so it's this characteristic brightening and then dimming now what's really fun is if you have a planet orbiting that star that's passing in front of the background star. And now you have two massive objects. The first massive object causes its characteristic up and down, and then superimposed on top of that up and down signal of light is the little planet's blip, <laughs> because the planet's gravity got in on the act. Yeah. 
And so if you see that characteristic double or actually sometimes multi-peak signal in your but just staring at a bunch of stars night after night after night after night, the microlensing folks have been able to measure an estimate for how many um, planets should be out at about three astronomical units, three times the Earth's sun distance. Okay. Just, you know, just out, like where the asteroid belt is. And that region nicely intersects the tail of what the transit missions can see and also where the radio velocities can see. And that the numbers are coming up and starting to match in that region is this wonderful, like, this is like you know, those like science moments where you're like, <laughs> you're, you're like, oh, this is how we learn to, this is how we start to believe something. Yeah. It's not just that we got the answer once, but we got the answer three times with three completely different techniques. And so I think that, you know, with the lengthening baselines and the increasing technology that allow us to, see transit signals and radio velocity signals and direct geoimaging signals. All of these are going to start overlapping with the microlensing signals. And I think we're going to start getting a very clear picture of planet populations. Wow. Okay. And I think that's one of the more exciting things to come out of the whole enterprise of finding plants is like, it's really cool that they're there. And sometimes the systems are very wacky and they have retrograde orbits that go over the poles or whatever. But mm -hmm. the ensemble of all of those planets starts telling you, it starts showing you a picture. It starts showing you a picture of like the, the truth in the universe that you couldn't get at any other way. And yeah, that's the very, very beautiful story that you just told. I, I love it. And it takes us back. So now that we have in hand these different techniques and what they're good for, uh, what kinds of planets they're good for, let's revisit this question of the population of planets around yeah. different kinds of stars. So you, you've already hinted, but maybe just it's worth reemphasizing how it's a the collection of solar systems is a little bit more heterogeneous and varied than we, than we would yeah. have expected before we actually looked. Like, I mean, I think in one way that you look at the solar system, it, it is that it has the sun in the center and that the sun is this um, ball of hydrogen that is its mass. You know, we always reference all the other stars in solar masses. So it's this one solar mass mm -hmm. uh, object that's got yellow, its spectrum peaks in the yellow part of the spectrum. Uh, it, it So it appears yellow to our eyes, but there's all of these other kinds of stars. There's less massive stars called the red dwarfs. And as if you like survey the entire galaxy and look at the distribution of star masses that are out there, what you find is there's far more of the le least massive stars than there are of the most massive stars. And it's a very, it's very skewed right. um, towards the small, low mass stars. So that, you know, in the immediate solar neighborhood, you know, if there is, you get out to about a hundred stars, about 80 of them are going to be red dwarfs, but the mass is less than about half of a solar mass. Okay. And so what we found is that red dwarfs have planets in abundance. There's lots and lots of planets. And that statistic of like at least five planets per star comes from an analysis of planet occurrence around red dwarfs. And so it looks like red dwarfs, by having planets at roughly the same rate as their the higher mass stars, they now just automatically move into what is typical in the in the galaxy because most the most typical star is a red dwarf. So if if you look at it through that lens, then then our sun looks very unusual and the solar system looks very unusual. Mm -hmm. And the red dwarfs last longer, also, right? They have longer lifetimes. Yeah, yeah, much longer. So the um, the Sun should live to be about 10 billion mm -hmm. years old. That's, That's a lot. A lot of years, but if we can just like think of it as like 10 billion. Well, um, the red dwarfs uh, are going to live anywhere from like a uh, hundred billion out to like, you know, indeterminate, you know, unmeasurable beyond the life of the universe type of world. Okay. <laughs> um, so the very last star that will be shining in the Milky Way will be one of these red dwarfs. And so the, any, if, any, if there's any planetary system around them, those would be the oldest like, planets and the, and, the, and the last planets left. So, that, I mean, that's interesting to put it in perspective. We're still in the kind of 
young, vibrant, uh, and in the solar system's case, short-lived phase of the universe's evolution. Uh, yeah, we're in the the very interesting, very bright phase. Right. And uh, as the as the as the universe gets older, everything is going to start reaching its lowest energy state, and it's just going to get real dark, real dim, real real gloomy. Um, but I, I, I like to think of those little red dwarfs as the last thing shining in that cold, <laughs> dark universe. <laughs> well, uh, maybe it's fun just to talk about Proxima Centauri B because it's the closest exoplanet, as mm -hmm. far as I understand. Mm -hmm. But it's also just an illustration of the weirdness. Uh, it's it's very much unlike the solar system in a lot of ways. Uh, the, the planetary system around it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in some ways, it. I mean, yeah, again, it, it all depends on how you want to look at it. So if you if you think like what's typical, like what, how do we want to characterize the, the solar system? If we characterize it by coplanarity, like all of the planets orbiting in the same plane, then it actually, I think Proxen, uh, its planetary system starts looking a little, you know, a lot more typical, a lot more like the, the like our solar system. But like the scale of it is just completely different. <laughs> um it's like a, in response to shrinking down the star, like the the system of planets around it overreacted and shrunk even faster. But <laughs> you know, it, it, it and that's what we're finding around red dwarfs is that like in that population of stars, what you find are solar systems that are extremely compact. Mm -hmm. So you know, the whole system goes from like you know, there's a four day planet, and then there's an eight day planet, and then there's a twelve day planet, and then way, 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 way out there, there's that fifty day planet. But if you like look at the solar system, our closest planet Mercury is like 88 days. It's just, these are the orbital periods. These are the years for these planets. Yeah, these are the years. It's orbital period. So, you know, a, a year on these planets, and you know, around a t like if you're in the habitable zone of a really low mass red dwarf like Proxima Centauri, uh, your year is starting to look like a few weeks. It, it, it's not. <laughs> everything just gets much more compact. Right. Um, and, and Proxima is also part of a triple star system, right? I mean, Alpha Centauri would be bright in the sky as a double star. Um, it is, yes. Yeah, the, so there's Alpha Cent A and Alpha Cent B, which are stars that are much closer in mass and brightness and color to our sun. Uh, and then oh, away, away from that pair of Proxima A and B is, is little, I'm sorry, not Proxima, Alpha Cent A and B. Way, way far away from that pair is right. uh, is Proxima Sin, uh, which is this little red dwarf uh, that is associated gravitationally, but you know, kind of on the outs with the other two. Yeah, it's something like half a million year orbital period around. Alpha very, very long. Like that. Yeah, yeah. They're but that's barely, just the, that's just barely the crazy. Together. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I, I think that it, that is a good reminder of how different the universe is or, or going to mm -hmm. be. Yeah, yeah. And, and that that right there um, is a way that the sun itself, just by being the sun, is unusual. Is that it's by itself. Like most stars have other stars that they share, a, a, you know, a, an orbit together. Um, and so that we don't have one also might make us unusual. Um, mm. We do know that there are planets that uh, orbit in binary star systems and triple star systems like Proxen, but there's also uh, planets that orbit around two stars at once. So the two stars are closer together than the planet is to those two stars. And mm. so those are circumbinary planets. And um, and those are very unusual, very wild. And we kind of caught those by luck, um, but we're still starting to get a handle on how common that system might be. That kind of So you're saying Star Wars was a documentary and Tatooine could be real. <laughs> yes, Tatooine's <laughs> Yeah, the dual sunset of Tatooine is something that, in principle, can be observed in the galaxy. So it's not in the galaxy far, far away. It might be our galaxy. You mentioned the habitable zone. Uh, tell us what that means. So the habitable zone is more of an idea uh, that we can attach like physical values to. But the idea is that in order to have life on a planet, you have to have liquid water. And the reason we think that is... <laughs> um, is reasoning that is uncomfortably close to that reasoning of like what we expected to find based on looking at the solar system. <laughs> um, all of the examples of life that we know of are on the Earth. So all of the examples of life that are on Earth require water for their existence. And so the idea by extrapolation is that you also need that uh, conditions for liquid water to exist on the surface of a planet for it to be habitable. And so that 
is going to be different for different stars, but you can think of it as the as this narrow range of distances where it's like the Goldilocks zone, where if it's too hot, you know, like if you're too close to the star, things are too hot and the water boils off. But if you're too far from the star, it, things are too cold and the water freezes out. And so the, yeah. there's a just right distance. So it's a range of distances from the central star and it forms like a band around the star. And so if a planet is in that band, then we would consider it potentially habitable. Yeah. So just to be super duper clear, that does not mean it is inhabited. That's right. Those are two <laughs> different. Yeah. Uh, habitable speaks to potential, not actuality. And uh, an obvious question to ask is, uh, are there ways of gathering data about all these 5,000 planets we found that would indicate whether any of them had life on them? Oh, that is tricky. Um, in principle, you could. And um, and we're going to start maybe testing that notion. That's in principle now. We might start practicing it um, soon with the, with the Webb Space Telescope, JWST, uh, which recently launched. And it has the capability of looking closely enough at the star, the light from the central star of a system that has a planet that is known to eclipse its star. And it can look during the eclipse and it can see the star spectrum so clearly that I can tell that the starlight is passing through the atmosphere of the planet. Mm. And so you get this tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of filtered starlight during the eclipse that contains information about the atmosphere of the, of the, of the, of the planet. And if everything lines up just right and we find just the right planetary system and all things work on JW is expected and the data analysis is done extraordinarily carefully and then checked and then rechecked, we'll have, maybe have just enough signal to start arguing about whether that was a biosignature. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I think that those types of arguments will just like rage on in the astronomy community from, the, from some point in the near future for some amount of time. And then eventually we might have like a large enough sample to draw a statistical conclusion that there's got to be life yeah. there somewhere. Okay. Um, but like it, these are very, very tenuous signals based upon assumptions that may or may not be present on other planetary, other planet surfaces, other life forms and things like that. Um, so we're making a guess at what spectroscopic signature we're going to see. And we're really crossing our fingers that we understand chemistry and biology well enough yeah, that we can predict say. what that 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 signature will be there, that it was detected, and that we're not fooling ourselves somehow. Well, I mean, we're near the end of the podcast now, so we're allowed to uh, be a little bit more speculative. So, have yeah, sure. your feelings about the existence of life, either uh, primitive or advanced, on other planets, uh, changed that much uh, because we've collected all this data? I think what it's done is it's it's opened the door wider to the possibility that we'll find those biosignatures, the, the evidence of life, um, the signatures of biology is what I mean by biosignature. And, um, and, and what I mean is that if, if two decades of looking for planets uh, left us with the conclusion that Earth-sized planets with the Earth's composition existing in the habitable zone of its star uh, just don't exist... Let's just say that that was the yeah. conclusion. Two decades of planet searching and just we never seen it, no hope of seeing it, not even a statistical sniff of it. It's just not happening. Well, then that would just close the door on the possibility of finding those biosignatures because we don't even have the initial conditions, right? Yeah. right? We haven't found the evidence that the initial conditions exist. But I think what we've done is we've expanded our knowledge of, of planets in the galaxy to the point where we say, yeah, this is, this is feasible, it's if the life exists, it's likely that we'll be able to observe it in just the right way to detect it. Um, it's leaving the door open for the possibility. But what sits on the other side of that door, just tons of technical challenges. And but like, at least we don't have to foreclose on the on the possibility. And do you have any favorite thoughts about why we haven't found them yet? The Fermi paradox? Uh, yeah, um, I, I wonder if our uh, some of the assumptions that go into that the existence of that paradox hold like the idea that like advanced civilizations necessarily have to get to the point of like space flight is one of their seminal achievements or a necessary precondition for other achievements. Um, like what is there, there's the possibility of life arising where 
the beings start forming a society in which everybody's needs are met just fine. And there's like no real like big push <laughs> because there's no such thing as a cold war. Yeah. Uh, there's like they there everybody's just like everything we ever want is right here, and the night sky is so beautiful to look at, and we and everything's taken care of to the point where we have the luxury of like pretty much everyone engaging and looking at the sky. Who's to say that like their first priority would be to beam a signal of their existence at some other star? They're just like they. <laughs> They, maybe they live, they just go through their entire existence as sentinel beings with that that impulse. And I don't know how to assess ahead of time the likelihood of that outcome versus our outcome, right? Mm-hmm. So who's to say like we're not this weird outlier uh, where our civilization developed in such a way that scarcity was a thing and that we couldn't figure out the distribution of things right, so we ended up going to war all the time. And then we had a we had a big old space race, basically just to piss the other side off. And it had the side effect of like sending telescopes up there. And then we started wondering like, well, I wonder if somebody out there is doing the same thing. Well, maybe they're not. Maybe they're just not doing the same thing at all. Maybe this impulse was weird and we just happen to live in that realization that it happened well or or i suppose you could imagine that humanity could change a little bit along those lines i mean yeah what, yeah like maybe we're not there yet yeah yeah i mean do you what are your feelings about the human exploration of space do you, do you think that that's just kind of a uh distraction or is that is that something that you look forward to down the road i look forward to living in a world where I feel like that's one of the most important things to do. Um, We're not there yet. But there's just too many yeah. needs left unaddressed here on earth for me to really think too much about that beyond like hoping for like the conditions where that would just feel right. You know, so I, I, I think that space exploration right now is not being conducted among nation states, it's being conducted among wealthy ol- oligarchs. And it it's, I don't trust them to make the right the decisions that will be beneficial to uh, all the rest of us who live under completely different conditions. Like (laughs) it's neat that they're flying up there, but it's not something that gets my heart pounding in terms of like exploring things, asking really interesting questions and, 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 and having those questions be the most important things governing the lives of most people on earth. So, um, that, that, but I have a different take than most astronomers. So, I, I recognize that, but I, I think no, it's good to have good. a variety of those ideas out there. Good to have a variety of takes. But uh, I guess then for the final question, let's, you know, even though human space exploration, like you say, is, is being largely driven by individuals now, uh, governments mm-hmm. are still doing most of the science in space. And sure. so yeah. what is your, you know, what, what, what gets you excited? What is the thing that is going to happen down the line? Uh, let's, mm. let's limit it to our lifetimes, but, uh, what, what are, what should the audience be looking for as a big next step in this field? I think it's not, it's not flashy, but I do think it's the most important thing. It's the thing that gets me most excited is the, it's the next set of major advances in understanding stars. Um, there's a whole subfield of astronomy called stellar astrophysics, and it hasn't been the the, the flashiest or most well-funded area of astrophysics in a long time. And it's largely been ironically supplanted yeah. by the field of exoplanets. So <laughs> exoplanets are actually piggybacking on a lot of the technology and techniques that were developed to study stars. And I there's going to be a moment where we reach a, a limit where the fundamental we're already there largely that the limit is that we don't have a good enough understanding of stars to really press forward in our understanding of planets because it is impossible to know things physically meaningfully know things about planets without knowing the stars to great detail and i think it's like one of the most impressive feats of the science of astronomy that we happen to know anything about stars not much less that we know them to like some cases to within a percent. It's just bonkers what we do. Nonetheless, a percent's not yeah. good enough sometimes. And so I think whichever graduate student does the unfortunately not very flashy thesis, but the most really important thesis of like figuring out new ways of incorporating new physics into our understanding of stellar interiors and spectra that or 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 understanding the ways that stars, these big fluffy balls of hydrogen vibrate and move around and obscure the signals that we're looking for. Uh, once that breakthrough happens, I, that's where you're going to really see the floodgates open up. And, I, and so um, that's where a lot of my interest is these days. It's just like, you know, how, wh- how do we advance our understanding of stars? And um, I often joke that like I'm an exoplanetary scientist by day, but by night, 
uh, I, I'm a stellar astrophysicist. And so it's, uh, I, I, this is another example of, a, like, I think that we, it's really important to evaluate what, like, what we prioritize or else we like might start undercutting the thing that we say that we're prioritizing. And so, um, I, I don't know. It's not, again, it's not the most standard take, but it is something that gets me really excited. I like it. I like it because it's not the standard take. That's a perfect way to end. So John Johnson, thanks so much for being on the Mindscape podcast. Thank you for having me. It's been fun.